Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. The story begins as we watch our protagonist. He is a businessman 9 to 5 by day and degenerate gamer by night. Eventually, his poor life choices catch up to him and he dies from a heart attack. He regains consciousness soon after and wonders if he's in a hospital. The room looks pretty old though and what's just a little more strange is that he sees a flying dog. Just then, he sees a reflection of himself and is shocked to find that he is now a baby. His name is now Ars, and we move forward to when he is 3 years old. Ars eventually realized that he had died and was reincarnated. When the shock of this news passed, Ars got right to work and mastered reading and writing while also becoming fairly knowledgeable about this new world. He was born in the Summerforth Empire, which rules the entire continent of Summerforth. Based on what he's seen so far, Ars has concluded that he isn't even on Earth anymore. Magic exists in this new world and lets those that use it conjure mysterious phenomena. This excites Ars greatly since it's pretty much like a video game. The Levant family Ars was born into is a noble household and they manage a small region called Lamberg. He lives in a huge house now and there are a ton of servants. There is even a live-in chef so Ars thinks that being reincarnated is the best thing to ever happen to him. During these three years, one other thing has become very clear to Ars. He has a power that nobody else does. Ars goes to watch some soldiers fight and they admire how often he comes to see them. He reveals to us that this unique ability is called appraisal. He uses it on a soldier named Milius and it allows Ars to see that this guy has a high aptitude as an archer. Milius is shocked that Ars knows his name and Ars wonders if he has ever used a bow before. Milius wouldn't be caught dead using a bow as he believes that a real man fights his opponents at close range. Ars doesn't tell anyone about his ability, so he just tells the guy that he has a feeling he would be good with a bow. Ars pleads for him to try, and Milius can't deny him. Milius has never shot a bow before, so the others recommend that he get closer to the target. Ars asks him to just try from this distance, and everyone is shocked when Milius hits the target dead center. Everyone thinks it was just beginner's luck, but Milius does it over and over again. Everyone is amazed, and they all suggest that he become an archer. Naturally, they wonder how Ars knew Milius would be good with a bow, and Ars just credits his instincts. Ars decides to hide his ability since he doubts that anyone would believe that he can see numbers that represent abilities and aptitudes. Ars' ability is definitely real, but the only problem is that he can't use it on himself for some reason. That night, Ars has dinner, and we meet his father Raven, who Ars is admittedly kind of scared of because he always looks angry. Ars uses his ability on him and explains just how amazing he is. His father rose from farmers to noble using his martial prowess. His prowess stat is so high that he can take out 10 men single-handedly. Raven heard about Ars using his instincts earlier, so he wants him to work hard on improving them. Ars will be the lord of the land one day, and the ability to discern the gifts of others will help him greatly. Ars decided to learn more about the empire after hearing that, but this just revealed how difficult the road ahead will be. The rulers of the Summer Fourth Empire are corrupt and peasant revolts are erupting everywhere. The nation is in chaos. If nothing changes, the empire will fall and it will lead to widespread war. Ars fears that as lord, he will have to lead troops into battle. He questions if he will really be able to protect Lamberg, but he desperately wants to since all the people have been so nice to him. Just then, Ars thinks about what his father said about discerning gifts and he gets an idea. Ars heads into town to use his appraisal ability on people, but using it so much really tires out his eyes. Just then, some poor kid gets kicked out of a shop. He doesn't look like the locals and some lady tells her kid to stay away from what they call a Malkin. Malkins are a group of people who came to Summerforth from across the sea. Most of them were brought as slaves and they are looked down upon. Just then, everyone is shocked as Ars gives the kid some bread and they wonder why he would be helping a filthy Malkin. Ars wonders if the kid is okay when he begins to cry, but he is shocked when his appraisal ability reveals the kid's amazing stats. The kid doesn't have a single flaw and his abilities are on par with one of Japan's greatest figures named Oda. Ars determines that the kid will definitely be a force to be reckoned with in the future, but the kid just thanks him for the bread and leaves. Ars follows the kid named Reitz, but the kid warns him not to since the townspeople will get mad at him. Just then, Reitz is shocked as Ars asks him to be his retainer. Ars's plan is to use his appraisal ability to gather the best people he can find so he can make his domain stronger. 
Ars explains that he is the son of the Lord of the Land and tells Reitz that he can sense great talent in him. The kid points out that they just met, but Ars doesn't want to tell him about his ability and just says that he has a good feeling about him. Reitz points out that he is a Malkin and doesn't want to cause trouble for Ars, but Ars says that he will take care of everything. The kid still declines, but Ars fears that he might never meet anyone with such incredible stats ever again, so he chases him. Ars hears the kid's stomach growling, so he convinces him to come to his house where they have an amazing chef. Ars was hoping to give Reitz a feast, but the prejudice against the Malkins runs deep. The chef only gives Reitz some beans, and the servants ask him to leave when he is done. Ars doesn't think he can change what they believe, so instead he shocks everyone by just offering to share his food. The servants try to stop him, but Ars silences them by pointing out that Reitz is his honored guest. They apologize and agree to give the kid more food. Reitz then explains that he used to be part of a mercenary group, but a lot of them died in battle and the rest of the group disbanded. He has been wandering around aimlessly because no one will hire a kid with no accomplishments to his name. Reitz was with his previous group his entire life, so Ars realizes how hard the disbanding must have been for him. The servants think that it's time for Reitz to leave, but Ars refuses to send him away and reveals that he's going to make Reitz his retainer. A servant thinks it's a terrible idea and warns that Ars' father will agree with him. He is correct as Raven tells Ars that taking a Malkin as a retainer is an outrageously foolish idea. Ars explains that Reitz has incredible abilities, but Raven states that Malkins are overwhelmingly inferior to the people of Summerforth. He thinks it would be impossible for a Malkin to have incredible abilities, so Ars is disappointed that even his own father believes in the conventional wisdom about Malkins. Ars is sure that Reitz will become incredibly valuable for Lamberg's future, so he requests that they test Reitz's abilities to prove it. Ars reminds his father about his exceptional instincts, so Raven agrees to test the kid. If he proves himself to be talented, then Raven promises to employ him as a soldier. Starting as a soldier isn't as good as being Ars's retainer, but Ars is sure that Reitz will be able to make a name for himself very soon, considering just how amazing his stats are. Just then, Ars is shocked as Raven reveals that he will fight Reitz in a mock duel for the test. Reitz will only win if he defeats him. Ars points out that Reitz is only 14 years old and he is not sure if he will be able to win against Raven as he was blessed with God-given skill in battle. Ars is still confident in Reitz, but the kid's prowess stat isn't as high as his father's. Raven explains that they won't fight on even footing and he will give Reitz a handicap. This sounds okay, so the guys agree. Before the fight, Reitz wonders if Ars is doing all this for a Malkin out of pity. Ars offers to call off the fight if Reitz doesn't want to be his retainer, but Reitz explains that he would be honored. It's the best offer he has ever received in his entire life, but it's just too unbelievable. Ars assures him by declaring that he needs Reitz. Ars will be the lord of the land one day, so when that time comes, he wants Reitz by his side. Reitz is inspired and promises to do his best. Outside, the other soldiers are shocked to see a Malkin. Raven instructs him to take a practice sword and explains that Reitz will win if he can land a blow against him before time runs out. Ars acknowledges that his father has the highest prowess stat in the land, but Reitz just needs to land one blow so he might have a chance to win. The two fighters introduce themselves and Raven tells Reitz to show him what he's got. The fight begins and Reitz can immediately tell that even though they are just using practice swords, Raven will cut him in half if he lands an attack. Reitz is in awe when he sees how quickly Raven is able to follow up his own attack without losing any power. Raven pushes him back a bit and Ars begins to lose hope as his father is just too powerful. The other soldiers know better though as they are shocked by Reitz's performance. Even when Raven goes easy on them, they can barely hold on to their swords let alone land the blow on Raven. However, this Malkin they are watching is actually keeping pace with Raven. That is in all though, as they can tell that Raven isn't holding back and he is actually going all out. Reitz gets sent flying and the soldiers determine that no matter how impressive the Malkin is, there is no way he can land a blow on the land's greatest swordsman. Time is running out and Reitz remembers what Ars told him. Reitz once again declares that he will do his best and Ars is surprised to see how much his expression has changed. Reitz moves in to attack but Raven is able to predict his movements. Everyone is shocked though when Reitz nearly manages to land a blow, but Raven explains that the fight is over. Reitz sees that there is a bit of time left, but the fight is over for a different reason. 
Everyone is then shocked as they realize that Rita's attack actually grazed Raven, and Raven declares that Rita has won. Ars knew his friend was gifted, and Raven keeps his promise to allow Reitz to become a soldier. Raven then acknowledges that Ars was right. Raven is able to tell that Reitz has true talent as well, and predicts that he might become a top class swordsman in the future. That isn't all though, as it's clear that Ars' ability to find talent is real, and it might even be an exceptional power of his own. Raven reveals that he feared how Ars would do in the chaotic future that lies ahead, but what he has seen recently makes him believe that Ars will become a great man. He could become a powerful noble, or maybe even the emperor. He says that this is just a joke though, since the throne is too lofty of a goal for the lord of such a small domain. As long as Ars carries on the family name, Raven will be happy. Rita's performance wins over all the soldiers, as they now all ask him for fighting tips. Afterwards, Ars is amazed by Rita's glow up, and we learn that Rita has decided to take on servant duties so he can help out as much as he can. Ars doesn't want him to overdo it since they are just a small domain, but having a liege to serve is like a dream for Rita. If it wasn't for Ars, Rita is sure that he would have died in the streets, so he thanks his new friend. He vows to spend the rest of his life repaying this debt, and Ars is happy about the start of his quest to build the strongest domain. A few months pass and we learn that Reitz has been mostly staying with Ars instead of taking part in battle. He has been very helpful while also demonstrating great fighting skill. Reitz has been receiving a lot of tutoring, which has increased his ingenuity stat drastically and he has become one of the most knowledgeable people in the entire household. The minute they got to know Reitz, the people of the household and the domain accepted him. The maids are even starting to gossip about him and they talk about how handsome he is. One day, Reitz gives Ars his history lesson for the day. He explains that the Summer Fourth Empire originally comprised of seven kingdoms. One of those kingdoms called Ansel amassed a great deal of power, so it invaded and conquered the other six kingdoms. Ansel's king Anathis declared himself the emperor and renamed the continent the Summer Fourth Empire. However, right now the entire empire is in a dire situation. The current supreme ruler is an eight-year-old child named Beterus, but the real power is held by his advisors, who are fighting amongst each other. With leadership waning, revolts have begun to break out. They are only skirmishes now, but even Raven has had to send some of his troops to calm things down. The situation could escalate, so Ars determines that he needs to use his appraisal ability to get talented people on his side before that happens. Ars's family resides in the territory called Mission, so he is shocked when Reese predicts that the bigger conflict would start there. Their governor is really old and in poor health, so it's likely that he won't live longer than a few more years. He has two sons, so he is torn as to who should succeed him. Both brothers want to inherit the position, so that could lead to war. Ars's father believes that the eldest son should succeed the governor. Which side he ends up fighting for isn't his choice, however, as he doesn't serve the governor directly. Lamberg resides in a district called Canary, so Raven serves its headsman. Ars is pretty nervous about the whole situation since he is just a kid, and the only good prospect he has found so far is Reitz. Luckily, Reitz actually sees all this as an opportunity. If a lord makes a good showing in a major conflict, it can help him advance in the world. Ars is inspired, so they agree to get stronger to make them more likely. Reitz vows to protect Ars and asks for his help in finding the right people to help him do that job. On their way to town, Ars notices that his father has been training more often and it's likely because he sees a war coming. Ars tells him that he's going to look for more recruits, so Raven asks him to find someone with a talent for magic. Raven can't use magic properly and his aides who can aren't that great with it. Raven once asked Ars to try magic, so he did while using a magical device but he was so bad with it that his father never asked him again. Having a mage will really bolster their forces, so Ars is determined to find the best possible candidate. They arrive at the capital of the Canary District, where Ars is shocked to learn that there are 50,000 people living there. Everyone looks so wealthy, and Ars would like to provide this kind of life to the citizens of Lamberg one day. Rita is sure that they will find a good candidate with so many people there, but Ars uses his ability for a while and doesn't find anyone promising. Ars's ability shows him a person's stats in the form of numerical values and aptitude ranks. Their actual talent is based on a combination of the two. Having high stats without the right aptitude won't amount to much. Ars is disheartened when he can't find someone, but Reitz points out that there is no rush. 
Further exploring leads Ars to find an alleyway where people are living. He is shocked so Rita explains that where there are wealthy people, there will also be the poor. Oftentimes, prosperity breeds inequality. Reitz realizes that Ars saved him from this kind of life, but unfortunately there is nothing they can do for these people right now. Ars realizes that he was only looking at all the prosperity before and thought it was a good town. However, in his view, a good town is a place where even the less fortunate can make a life for themselves. Ars knows that he might be naive, but he wishes that he could find their next candidate among these less fortunate. Reitz doesn't think that he's naive at all and Ars is shocked when he just says that he's proud to be his aide. Afterwards, they head to the largest market in town where Ars is offered a dragon egg. Ars can't believe that dragons exist in this world and the merchant sees how excited he is, so he offers to make the rare eggs one silver each. Ars eagerly reaches for his money, but Reitz is furious with the merchant. Ars is shocked, but Reitz knows that the guy illegally smuggled the eggs because trade has been frozen with the northern continent. The size of the eggs and the spots on them don't even look right, and what's even more suspicious is that this merchant has so many rare dragon eggs. Reitz has determined that they are actually giant lizard eggs, so he decides that this guy's punishment for humiliating Ars will be death. Ars begs him to stop, so Reitz apologizes for getting carried away. Ars fears that Reitz will act this way every time he gets tricked, so he decides to wise up quickly before he gets someone eliminated. The guys take a break to eat, but someone bumps into Ars when he tries to buy some candy. He is surprised when Reitz points out that they stole his money, so they chase after the person. This person is pretty fast so it's hard to catch up to them, but Reitz pulls off their coat to reveal that it's a girl. The guys follow her into an alley where she is surrounded by some guys who start beating her up. Ars tells them to stop so they try to attack him, but Reitz stops them and teaches them a little lesson. They run off and Ars thinks his buddy is really cool. Ars checks the girl to see if she is okay and he is shocked to see that she has an S tier aptitude as a mage. That is an all though as her leadership has a potential to reach 92 and her prowess can get as high as 116. She is a very young girl, but her prowess rivals that of even Ars' father. Every stat not related to magic has a D for aptitude, but that's fine because she must possess incredible magic power already. Reitz tells her to give Ars his money back, but Ars interrupts to ask her to become his retainer. Reitz points out that she is a thief, but Ars reveals that she has incredible talent for magic and he has never seen someone with such potential. The girl interrupts him to declare that she would rather end her own life than serve a child like Ars. Ars tries to tell her that she has incredible potential with magic, but she doesn't believe him as she has never used magic before. The clever kid approaches this from a different angle. Ars determines that she is a thief because she has had a rough life, so he explains that as his retainer, she will have a salary and be given meals regularly. The girl still refuses though and just calls Ars a spoiled brat. She really hates nobles as she wonders what right they have to look down upon others. She thinks that they are all so privileged without doing anything other than just being dealt a lucky hand at birth. She really hammers her point home when she says that she has no interest in serving as a tool to protect Ars's lavish lifestyle. Ars explains that he is nothing like the noble she is talking about. He wants to create a town where people like her can live stable lives and he needs her help for that. The girl points out that these people are suffering right now and this idea of helping them someday is just the naive thoughts of someone living in the high life for too long. She assumes that Ars just wants her help so he can show everyone how kind he is and so he can feel good about himself. Reitz interjects to simply tell her to give the money back so she does because she doesn't want to owe them for saving her. Ars notices a mark on her wrist so she reveals that she was caught sneaking into a noble's estate and she was sold off to a slave trader. She managed to get away, so those guys Reitz beat up were the slave traders lackeys. Ars thinks that she should leave town since they are looking for her, but she says that she can't. Just then a bunch of kids go to hug her and she points out that they are parentless children. No one loves them so she can't just leave them behind. Ars now understands, so he agrees not to try to recruit her anymore, but he does give her his pouch of money. She reminds him that he's giving it to her willingly, so he won't be able to ask for it back. Ars says it's hers now, so she calls him a weirdo and leaves with a no parent having kids. That night, Ars can't stop thinking about the harsh life that the girl is living. Reitz knows it well, so he points out that the world isn't kind to the people on the bottom. She was probably treated poorly by nobles in the past, so that must be why she hates them. 
Reitz points out that Ars is nothing like that, but Ars has realized that he's taking his privileged lifestyle for granted, so he understands why she would see him that way. Ars really does want to create a better town, but she may have been right about what she said. Just then, Ars spots the orphans from before, and they reveal that the girl named Charlotte has been captured. A brief look into Charlotte's past shows just how difficult of a life she had. She was just a child, but she couldn't even remember the last time she cried. As she stares at a happy little girl, she wonders if the last time she cried was when she realized that she didn't have parents. Things only got worse for her as she grew up. She was poor and homeless, so people treated her poorly. She wonders if she last cried when she realized that she is less than human. She gives up on trying to remember and just wonders why she was born in the first place. Back to the present, Charlotte is kicked by the goons relentlessly for making their jobs harder. They are disappointed to see that they still can't make her cry, so they kick her some more. The slave trader reminds them not to hurt her face because he already has a buyer for her and he doesn't want to get on the evil guy's bad side. The goons find that she has a bunch of money, so Charlotte tries to take it back, but she ends up paying the price. Charlotte was trying to get the money back for the orphans, but the trader explains that there's no hope for her. Even if she escaped, she would just be returning to a life of misery. He recommends that she just accept that her life is over and tells her to blame her parents for abandoning her. Just then, all the goons are startled when Reitz barges in. He easily wrecks a bunch of the goons and Charlotte wonders why they came. The trader tells him that they have some nerve breaking in, but he is shocked when Ars somehow knows his name. The guy can tell that Ars is a noble by the way he's dressed, but he refuses to let Charlotte go free. He explains that she is just merchandise, and nobles like Ars and his family are the ones buying them in secret. He hopes that Ars as a noble would understand, but this just upsets Ars even more. Charlotte wants Ars to stay out of this situation since he hardly knows her, but Ars has been thinking about something since they met. He has been trying to figure out why her eyes are so empty, and he has finally realized that her ambition stat is only at 1. Ambition refers to someone's personal hopes for themselves. It represents a desire to improve, tenacity, and a hope for the future. Charlotte's is just one, which means she has given up on her future. The trader has a good laugh as he points out again that she is just a slave, so of course she has no future. This behavior enrages ours as he points out that adults are supposed to protect the future of children. This guy not only took Charlotte's future away, but now he's laughing about it. Ars reaches his boiling point as he says that it should be up to Charlotte to decide what she becomes, not these goons. Charlotte then remembers that she stopped crying because it doesn't help someone survive. She gave up on having dreams a long time ago as she believed that destinies are decided when people are born. Closing her heart was the only way she could protect herself from people's terrible treatment of her. She learned that tears are for the weak and in her life weakness means death. She decided that she would only focus on being strong to survive, which makes it difficult to figure out why out of all times, she is crying now. The traitor is done being nice to Ars, so Charlotte tells him to run away. Ars tells her not to worry though, and instructs Reitz to take care of them. The goons say that they're in real danger now, but Reitz slams one of them down. He explains that they will pay the ultimate price for angering his lord Ars, which is death. The goons are confident they can overpower him since he is so outnumbered, but Reitz easily takes out a whole bunch of them. The idiots even try to use magic against him, but this doesn't even slow Reitz down. Reitz stands over all the defeated goons, and the traitor calls him a monster. The traitor says that he is left with no other choice, so he calls his biggest goon. This giant was an infantry commander, but he was kicked out for bad behavior. Charlotte is worried about this guy, but Ars uses his ability on him and tells her not to worry. The guy looks down on them, but Reese points out that he can only do that if he makes it out of their fight alive. This makes the guy attack Reitz immediately, but Reitz's talents are just on another level. Reitz quickly knocks this guy out, and Charlotte is stunned as she wonders who these guys are. The trader just now explains that the headman of the Canary District approves of slave trade. Ars already knows, so he declares that he's simply going to buy Charlotte. The trader tries to refuse, but Reitz points out that they can easily just take her from him. This would be way worse since it would look bad for the trader if he lost a slave that already had a buyer. It would sound much better if he just sold her to a buyer that offered more. The guy begrudgingly agrees to let them buy her, so Ars offers to take her back to her friends. Charlotte wants to go somewhere first, but this place is in the forest and Ars isn't much of a hiker. They arrive at the place and Ars is amazed by the beautiful view. 
This is Charlotte's secret spot, and it makes all the problems she faces in the town seem so small. This place clearly means a lot to her, so Ars wonders why she is showing him. She has been giving what he said some thought, and she wonders why he wants to build a town where even people like her can live stable lives. Ars' answer is simple, he likes children. Charlotte points out that he is a child, but Ars explains further. He knows that when a person is feeling run down, a child's smile can lift a person up. Ars believes that this is because a child's smile is so full of hope. Having hope means being excited for the future, and that excitement holds great power. Ars believes that smiles are infectious, and the enthusiasm that brings is what makes a city a better place. That is part of the reason why he wants to make a place where children can always have hope. That's why he wants to build a town where people can live hopeful and stable lives. Ars apologizes as he realizes that he sounds like he's lecturing her, but Charlotte surprisingly agrees to be his retainer. Ars reminds her about the orphans, but she explains that they are why she's doing it. She wants them to have the kind of future Ars is talking about. Just then, Reach shows that in the warehouse, he found an item for using magic. Reach trusts Ars' ability to find talent, but he wants to see for himself if Charlotte can use magic. She agrees to do it, but reminds them that she really hasn't used any magic before. She doesn't even know how to cast spells or anything. As Reitz explains how to her, Ars thinks about how he has never seen anyone else with an S-rank aptitude for magic. Ars wonders just how powerful she is, and Charlotte is ready to show him. She recites a short incantation, and releases an incredibly powerful fire spell. The guys are shocked but that isn't all, as the spell can be seen far and wide. People everywhere are amazed by the fire that covers the sky, and the magical item shatters. The guys are still in awe, and Charlotte finally shows some confidence. Ars couldn't be happier, and Reitz finally acknowledges her talent. Charlotte is glad to hear that she will receive a monthly salary, a place to stay and regular food, but she would like all the money to be sent to help the orphans instead. All she will need is the place to stay with some food, so Ars agrees to do it. Ars always knows just what to say, as he declares that he can't wait to see what her future holds. Charlotte declares that she will do everything in her power to make Ars' dream come true, and she calls him Lord Ars. Ars points out that she doesn't have to be so formal, so she is relieved because she isn't that good at it, and she is older than him anyway. Charlotte apologizes for taking their money, and thanks them for saving her. Ars says it's not a big deal, as he just wants to get home and eat something. She tells Reitz that Ars' future is the one she really wants to see, and Reitz agrees. As Charlotte tells the orphans that she's going to get some milk, Ars thinks about how happy he is that he now has two dependable allies. The House of Levant is undoubtedly getting more powerful, but Ars can't deny that he's starting to feel the pressure. He is surrounded by amazing people, but Ars doubts if he can lead them since he is so ordinary. If he messes it all up, then he will be betraying their hopes for him. Ars regains his composure when he reminds himself that he made a promise to them, and he will do all he can to build a great town. They all finally stop to eat a meal, but it becomes pretty clear that Charlotte will have to learn the basics of manners and speech. Charlotte thinks it will be impossible, but Reitz explains that she must if she will be accompanying Ars at meals. Charlotte tells Ars that she would rather take a nap, but Reitz has to remind her that he is Lord Ars to them. Afterwards, Raven refuses to accept Charlotte, as he believes that the battlefield is too dangerous for women. However, Ars has Charlotte demonstrate her power, so Raven quickly changes his mind and gladly accepts her into their home. Three years pass and we learn that the Canary District that Lamberg is in has been having disputes with the province of Seats. Raven has been dispatched to battle several times, but spirits remain high among the troops. Raven has just returned from a victorious battle, and he explains that the star of the fight was once again Charlotte. Charlotte has made quite a name for herself these past three years, and Ars goes to greet her. Charlotte appeared like a comet on the battlefield, and soon became the most feared mage around. She was even given the title Levant's Lady of Flames. It's all thanks to her that their mage corps is now the pride of House Levant, alongside Raven's infantry troop. That isn't all that has changed, as we learn that Ars now has a little brother and sister. Of course, Ars uses his appraisal ability on them, and their stats make it clear that they will both be crucial to House Levant's future. Just then, Reitz reveals that a family of hunters has just moved into Lamberg. Two of the brothers are pretty tall and strong, so Reitz believes that they might be a good addition to their unit. Reitz and Ars decide to go visit them, so Charlotte tags along as Ars' escort as she is off duty. 
The three of them are a bit too heavy for their poor horse, so they are traveling more slowly than they expected. Reeds blames Charlotte for weighing them down, but she points out that she and ours put together don't weigh as much as a single adult. Charlotte tells Reeds to just get off and run, so the two begin to argue about who will protect ours. Just then, they are all impressed when two hunters take out a boar. Ours uses his appraisal ability and determines that the two of them must be the brothers they heard about. They have some pretty decent prowess stats of 67 and 65. The one named Gatos has a rank potential for infantry, and the one named Marcus is A-ranked for archery. Ours reveals that he has a request for them, so they take our group to their house. Their father apologizes for not having better food, but our group thinks it's delicious. The meat they are eating is from the creature they just caught. Ours then explains that he would like to have Gatos and Marcus serve as soldiers for House Levant. Reitz explains that Ars has an eye for talent, and he sees a lot of potential in the brothers. The father is amazed by Ars, since he is so mature for his age. Ars is very different from his third son named Russell, who is around the same age, but the father calls him inept. Just then, Charlotte rats out Russell, who is then caught trying to sneak out some food without greeting their guests. The father forces him to say hello, and they notice that the kid has a different hair color than the other brothers. Just then, Ars casually uses his appraisal ability, not expecting much, but he's utterly shocked when he sees this kid's ingenuity stat. It has a max potential of reaching 109, so Ars compares him to some legend. This kid could become a monster, and Ars doubts that he would find a higher stat in all the Summer 4th Empire. His current stats are pretty low because he's only 5 years old, but with some training, he would make a great retainer. The father finishes scolding him, but he is shocked when Ars reveals that he wants Russell as a retainer as well. The father thinks the kid will just mess things up, but Ars insists. Russell assumes the worst when it comes to fighting, so he says heck no to the request because he doesn't want to die. Russell locks himself in his room, and Reitz can't help but compare it to when Charlotte rejected Ars. The father apologizes for the kid's timid behavior. He explains that his mother died two years ago, so he has been withdrawn ever since. He is nowhere close to where his brothers were at his age, so the father is sure that Russell would struggle just to survive, much less go to war. Ars reveals that Russell's talents aren't for being a soldier like his brothers. Russell's talents are that of the mind. He is a strategist, and his incredible intelligence will be vital to Ars's cause. Ars goes to ask him again, but the kid is terrified, so Ars apologizes for being so forward. He notices that the kid likes books, so Russell explains that he only has the one, and his mother used to read it to him all the time. Russell is one depressed little kid, as he states that he's bad at everything, but when he reads, he can forget all the bad things around him. Ars comes up with an idea, and offers to take Russell to his family's library that has a ton of books. He will even let Russell take any books he wants, but the kid thinks it's a trick to force him to do what they say. Ars insists that there's no catch, so Russell agrees to go. However, he demands that his brothers come with, since he still fears that he will die on his own. At Ars' house, Russell is terrified as he is attacked by a ferocious beast, but Ars points out that it's just their dog. Charlotte takes the older brothers to show them the barracks, so Russell is terrified that they left him. His attitude quickly changes though, when he sees the giant library. Ars goes to have his morning lesson, and leaves the kid under Rita's care. After some time passes, Ars rushes back to the library, hoping the kid hasn't left already. He arrives to find that Russell frantically tried to read as many books as he could, but he tired himself out and fell asleep. Reitz reveals that Russell was able to learn new words the instant Reitz defined them, and he even quickly developed a deep understanding of them. What's most shocking though is that Russell's ingenuity stat is already shooting up just after a few hours of reading. The brothers arrive to see the kid unconscious, and they can't understand why he enjoys books so much when he can't even read. This comes to a surprise to ours, so the boys explains that they were never taught to read since hunters don't need it. When Russell wakes up, ours asks him how he learned to read. Russell simply says that when his mother used to read to him, he would match what she said with the words on the page. By doing this, he was eventually able to read. The brothers point out that he was just a baby back then, so Russell shockingly reveals that he remembers most of what happened since the day he was born. Teaching himself how to read is pretty incredible, so Ars decides that he can't let a talent like this kid get away. Ars still needs a way to convince them, so Reitz comes up with the idea to show them that there are ways to hunt without a bow. Ars likes it, so he tells the brothers that traps are used for hunting in other countries instead of bows. 
Russell read about them in a book, but the other brothers are skeptical. The Sioux that they hunt are fast and smart animals, so they aren't sure if a trap would work against them. Ars explains to Russell that strength and stamina are not a person's only weapons. In Russell's case, it's his brain. Ars is sure that Russell's father will acknowledge him if he creates a trap, but Russell doubts that he will be able to do it. Luckily, his brothers encourage him to impress their father and offer to help him in any way they can. Russell would like to be useful to his brothers, so he agrees to give it a try. Sometime later, their father Greg is shocked to see some structure with a bunch of Sioux inside. Greg doesn't understand, so the brothers explain that this is a trap Russell made. Russell then says that if the brothers went off to be soldiers, then Greg would be left alone to hunt all by himself, so he wanted to make it easier for him. Russell read that Sioux have a tendency to rush at anything yellow, so he used a fence and painted it yellow to lure them in. That is an Aldo as Russell read that baby Sioux and nursing mothers hate the smell of herbs, so he strung some herbs around to keep mothers and babies out. This kid thought of everything as he also made little exits in case babies do get caught inside. Russell wanted to avoid targeting the young because that could cause the animal to go extinct. Greg is amazed since Russell took into consideration that his father would prefer to keep a balance with nature. The brothers are sure that their father will finally have to acknowledge Russell's talents, but they are shocked by his response. Greg just coldly tells Russell's brothers to take Russell with them when they set out the next day. Russell objects, but Greg tells him that he must leave home, and he asks Ars to look after him. This confirms to Russell that his father really does hate him. He wants him to leave home, and Russell can't stay with his father anymore, so he has no choice but to stay with Ars from now on. Ars rejects this idea though, and tells Russell to go home for now, since he is sure that Greg has his reasons for saying what he said. That night, Russell thinks about how his mother started getting sick after he was born. He figures that his father hates him because he is the reason she died. Russell blames himself and he is sure that everyone blames him as well. That is why he shuts himself in his room on the anniversary of her death. Russell thinks that he killed his mother and now he can't even be useful to his family so he wishes he was never born. Just then the rest of the Russell family sneaks up to the roof. The brothers hope they can make their father proud as soldiers and they have a toast to their mother. The brothers wonder why Greg spoke to Russell the way he did, since Russell's trap was amazing. It turns out that Greg thinks Russell should resent him. He failed to see Russell's talent and potential, so he considers himself to be a failure as a father. Greg wants Russell to spend the rest of his life in a place where his talents can shine. However, Russell is kind like his mother was, so the only way to get him to leave was to make him hate and resent his own father. This is the only way Greg can atone for failing as a father, and he hopes that his older sons will be able to support Russell as he failed to do so. Greg declares that Russell is his precious son just like his two others, and we see that Russell heard everything. The next day, Ars arrives to take the brothers, and everyone is shocked when Russell confidently declares that he will be going with them. Ars points out that going with them means that he won't be able to see his father for a while, but Russell already knows. Greg doesn't say a word and just goes to chop wood, so Russell declares that he can never hate him. Russell is going with Ars because he knows that he's no use at home. That is why he wants to go study and learn all kinds of things so he can become useful to the village. He vows to learn how to make better traps and just hopes that they can live together again when that day comes. The two get emotional and Greg promises to wait for him. The brothers thank Ars but Ars explains that he didn't actually care if Russell became his retainer. Russell is an amazing talent, but Ars cared more about seeing his bond with his father restored. The brothers are amazed by his character, and they vow to serve Ars the best they can. Russell does too, and Ars is glad to have them. Sometime later, Raven gets sick, so Ars offers to lead the next engagement. Ars is 9 years old now, and he tells his father that he is in no condition to fight. Things have gotten pretty bad though, so Raven says that he must lead the fight. We then learn that the governor of Mission passed away, and he named his younger son Vamar his successor. However, the older brother Kuran accused him of forging the documents. Kuran made a name for himself on the battlefield, so he gained supporters that believed he should have inherited the throne. The province of Mission was torn, and the neighboring province of Seats took advantage by pressing the offensive. Ars figures he will have to enter the battlefield soon, but Raven explains that Ars needs to be thinking more about something else. Ars is then shocked when Raven reveals that he arranged for Ars to get married and forgot to tell him about it. 
Aris tells everyone the terrible news and he explains that he just received a letter from the girl he will be marrying. Charlotte teases him as she thought he would marry her, but this is no time for jokes. Aris is then summoned outside as his fiance has arrived. He panics though as he has never even had a girlfriend in his past life. The girl introduces herself as Leisha and Ars can't believe that this girl is the one he will be marrying. He of course uses his appraisal ability on her which shockingly reveals that she has the diplomacy of 100 and ambition of 80. This is pretty terrifying and Ars can't understand how her ambition stat could be so high. It doesn't make sense because she seems so kind and gentle. Just then Ars realizes that it could just be an act and her ambition means she wants to take the throne from him. Raven is very sick, so Ars determines that he's the only one that can stop her evil plan. His staring makes her blush though, so Ars forgets everything he just thought about and just thinks how adorable she is. Just then, Leisha's butler rudely points out that there's a Malkin there, but Leisha explains that he is Reitz. Tales of his battlefield exploits are legendary, so she forces her butler to apologize. Afterwards, Leisha is welcome to the home and shows a lot of respect as she introduces herself to all the staff. While they eat, Leisha points out that Ars has some food on his face and he realizes that she has been carrying the conversation. Ars is in awe of her because she is great at communication, quick-witted, and her etiquette is masterful. If it wasn't for his appraisal skill, Ars is sure that he would be head over heels by now. Ars wishes he could show her around Lamberg, but it's raining. He is then shocked when she says that the rain will stop and it does. Ars wonders if she has some kind of ability to control the weather, but she explains that she was simply analyzing the movements of the clouds. Ars's retainers watch them, and Russell has a bad feeling about Leisha. Charlotte compliments his instincts, as she also has a feeling that the girl might be dangerous. Later, Ars takes Leisha around Lamberg, where everyone is delighted to meet his fiance. They all want to celebrate, so Ars thinks about how he cannot tell them that Leisha might be a threat to their domain. An argument breaks out nearby and Ars decides that as the next lord of this land, he should try to settle it. However, he is sure that if he fails, Leisha will use this as an opportunity to undermine his authority. Charlotte appears and offers to handle the situation with a magic attack. Leisha talks her out of it and is amazed by her because she is a fan of the famous mage. Russell's then disappointed when Charlotte seems to forget about her suspicions simply because of Leisha's flattery. Leisha offers to settle the argument, but would like for Ars to do her a favor if she is successful. She doesn't even tell him what the favor is though, and just goes to settle it. Leisha starts by introducing herself and explaining that she will be marrying Ars. She then offers to buy the materials that they were arguing over, since her country can't mine them on their own. On top of that, her country has a place to mine the actual materials one of the guys needed, so she offers to sell him some at a very reasonable price. This settles everything, and Leisha shockingly gives Ars all the credit for coming up with the idea. Like a good leader though, Ars gets over the shock quickly and instructs everyone to use contracts during negotiations moving forward in order to prevent problems like these. Leisha says it's not a big deal when Ars thanks her, and he realizes that her diplomacy really is next level. Afterward, Charlotte admits that Leisha did a good job, but declares that she still doesn't accept her. Charlotte leaves annoyed by the whole marriage situation and leaves Ars in shock. Leisha then reveals that the favor she wants is for Ars to answer a question honestly. Ars assumes that she wants information for her devious plan, but he is shocked when she just wants to know what kind of person he likes. Ars assumes that it's an act and tries to figure out what she's really after. However, he realizes that she's just too smart and he won't be able to outthink her. Ars decides to just meet her head on and declares that he likes people who speak their minds and hide nothing from him. Ars expects a battle of wits, but Leisha just says that she will keep that in mind. That night, they enjoyed a meal and a magic show, but Ars could never figure out what Leisha was after. He decides to try again tomorrow, but he is shocked when he finds that Leisha snuck into his room. She did it to see the shocked look on his face, so Ars realizes she likes messing with him. Leisha reminds him that he likes people that speak their minds, so she snuck in hoping to have an honest conversation. Ars is eager to hear what she has to say, but he is shocked when she wants to know what he thinks of her. Leisha reveals that she has a special talent for telling how people feel just by looking at them, even when they're trying their best to hide it. She could tell that he was suspicious of her from the start, but she prides herself on being able to put people at ease with just a few minutes of conversation. 
However, everything she did only deepened his suspicion of her, so she wonders what it is about her that he distrusts so much. Ars is amazed by her observational skills, but he feels bad. People aren't able to see stats like he can, so most people probably just trust her right away. Ars knows that he could probably just brush the question off, but he doesn't and instead he decides to be honest. Ars reveals his appraisal ability to her and explains that she has incredibly high diplomacy and ambition stats. This makes him believe that all her actions are calculated and she must have an ulterior motive. Leisha surprisingly believes him because it does explain a lot of his actions. She admits to having a lot of ambition but hesitates to tell him what that ambition is for. She eventually reveals that she wants an amazing man to fall in love with her but she gets embarrassed by Ars's silence. Ars just says that that's wonderful and thinks about how it's true that the best path for survival for a lord's daughter is to marry a powerful man. Ars gets pretty sad about this because getting married to a lord of a weak domain like his must be less than ideal for her. For the first time, Leisha can tell what Ars is thinking. So she assures him that if she found Ars to be a good for nothing oaf, then she would have done whatever was necessary to break off their engagement. Spending time with Ars has changed her mind, so she does wish to marry him. The shocked Ars reminds her that his territory is small, but she is sure that that will change. She sees a lot of promise in Ars, but he just credits all the amazing people around him. That's exactly what she means. Everyone loves Ars for who he is, and he doesn't even have to try. This is very important in a good lord, and Leisha admits to loving him the same way everyone else does. In Ars' shock, he can only say thank you, and she leaves. Ars calls himself an idiot for the lame response, and thinks about how great it was that Leisha spoke her mind. Outside his room, Leisha is embarrassed about sneaking into a gentleman's room. She calls herself a fool for the utterly disgraceful behavior. However, this is the first time she has ever told anyone how she felt. On her way home, Leisha thinks about how the world of nobility is an awful place. Everyone lies and they don't hesitate to bring someone down to ensure their own position of power. Leisha has always hated her ability to sense these feelings in them. However, Leisha discovered that if a strong man with political power falls in love with someone, then they can escape the awful place. She did not want to marry into the House of Levant because she wanted to marry into one much stronger. Her only goal with Ars was to leave a good impression, but she only made him suspicious. She could never tell what Ars was thinking, but one thing during her visit changed her mind about him. One day, Ars thought her feet would be hurting from walking around so much, so he got her something to help with any blisters. That was when she realized that his kindness is boundless and not tied to anyone's rank or position. The people of his domain treat him like family, so she wants to be part of that world. Not only that, but Ars also accepted her for who she is. Leisha now thanks God for her power as she finally knows how to use it. She is sure that people will want to take advantage of Ars' kindness, which is why she wants to be by his side. If anyone tries to hinder the beautiful world he's building, then she vows to crush every single one of them. We then learn that Ars and Leisha have started sending letters to each other and they discuss their last meeting. She reminded him that he never responded to her declaration of love, but she didn't want to push him. Instead, she declared that she would do her best to make him fall in love with her at first sight. A couple years later, we find that Ars is now 11 years old. Things aren't going so well though, as Raven's condition has worsened severely. The doctor recommends that Ars prepare for the worst, so he thinks about how he hasn't even come close to repaying his father for what he has done for him. Ars then begs that he be given more time. Elsewhere, we see that a governor is assassinated and the culprit takes his own life by jumping out a window. Raven learns that the governor of Mission was eliminated and he turns to Russell to hear what might happen next. Russell predicts that a terrible war is coming and Raven agrees as the heads of each district and mission will be forced to side with one of the brothers in the succession dispute. The head of the Canary District will likely choose the elder brother Kiron. When he does, Raven makes sure that everyone understands that their land of Lamberg will follow him. Raven tries to go make preparations, but he's in no condition to move. Later, the head of the Canary District summons Raven with a letter. Reitz offers to go because Raven is unable to, but Ars declares that this time he will be going. Our group arrives to meet with the head of the Canary District, but the guard at the gate is skeptical. Ars is very young, so he questions if Ars is really from House Levant. Just then, he recognizes Levant's Lady of Flames, and Ars realizes that Charlotte really is famous. The guy is then stunned when he recognizes the Reaper of Levant, 
and the others can't believe that Reitz has such a terrifying nickname. The name makes Reitz sound more dangerous than he would like, but the guard thinks it suits him pretty well. Being with them is enough proof for the guard, so they are allowed inside. A servant of the head of the Canary District introduces himself as Minas. He wishes good health to Raven, and Ars uses his ability on him. The average of all his stats are pretty high, so he is like a jack of all trades. Minas is impressed by Ars' retainers, so he would like for them to serve their house. They reject the offer though, and explain that they have sworn loyalty to House Levant. Ars is then taken to meet the other domain leaders. Ars introduces himself as a stand-in for his father, but he just gets ignored. Ars wonders if they are skeptical of him because of his age, but one of the lords compliments him on his introduction. This guy's name is Arlo, and Ars remembers this guy from when he was younger. Arlo is nice enough to offer Ars some cookies, but the other lord is glaring at Ars. Just then, everyone stands as the head of the Canary District arrives. His name is Lemire, and his stats are fitting for a headman. What's even more amazing is that what Lemire lacks, his retainer Minus makes up for. Lemire declares that a war is coming, so he has decided that the Canary District will support the elder son Curon. None of the lords object, so Lemire tells them to ready their forces. The province of Seats will surely try to capitalize on the situation, so they need to be prepared. The other lords start issuing orders, but Ars is just relieved that the nerve-wracking meeting is over. Just then, Lord Lumiere speaks directly to Ars. He acknowledges that Lamberg is a small domain, but it has demonstrated strength that far surpasses its size. He commends Ars for acting as a proxy for his father at just 11 years old, and he has high hopes for House Levant. Lumiere looks forward to seeing their growth, and they all promise to do their best. Just then, the guy that was glaring at Ars introduces himself as Hammond. He is the lord of the Torbekista domain, and Ars realizes that he is Leisha's father. Hammond reveals that Leisha has been distraught recently, and it has something to do with Ars. Ars has no clue what he could have done wrong, so Hammond wonders if he has been responding to Leisha's letters. Just then, Ars remembers that he was right in the middle of replying to her when his father collapsed and the governor was assassinated. Ars realizes that it's been a couple days since he received the letter, so he promises to respond to her the second he returns home. Hammond reveals that Leisha is usually so poised and self-possessed, but she has begun to express her feelings more openly. Hammond credits Ars for this change, as she seems to care for him deeply. Leisha is a very bright girl, so Hammond always left her to her own devices, while he focused more on political affairs. For this reason, he is sure that she has lived a lonely life. To make things worse, his domain has been host to many ugly conflicts between nobles, and he is sure that this affected Leisha. Hammond takes the blame for this, so he now just wants her to find happiness. He initially turned his anger towards Ars, but this was just because he was being protective, so now he apologizes. Hammond hopes that Ars will take care of Leisha when they get married, so Ars promises to do everything in his power to make her happy. Ars thought that this guy was scary at first, but now he realizes that Hammond just cares about his daughter. Later, Ars tells Raven about Lemire siding with Curon. Ars fears that his father will be upset for answering Lemire's summons without telling him, but he is shocked when Raven compliments him on doing a good job. Later, Ars writes back to Leisha. He explains that things have been very eventful, so he apologizes for not responding sooner. Ars writes about how nice her father is and how much he cares about her. Things are getting pretty tense with war approaching, so Ars just hopes that the houses can work together to be victorious. Ars is worried about Leisha because if he is nervous about the war, then she must be terrified. Just then, he remembers the promise he made to Hammond, so he vows to win and protect Leisha. Sometime later, Reitz apologizes to Ars for knocking him down while sparring, but Ars doesn't want him to apologize. Ars wants to become stronger for the war, so he asks that Reitz attack harder. Reitz thinks they should take a break since they have been practicing all day, so he is amazed when Ars demands that they keep going. Ars thinks about how everyone else is training to get stronger and stronger, but he hasn't improved at all. Ars recently led some troops in a mock battle, and it was a total failure. He has done tons of reading about warfare, but Ars has no real life experience. Because of this, he flinches anytime real soldiers charge at him. Ars knows that Reitz and Charlotte will be by his side on the battlefield, but he wants to be able to stand strong on his own. Regardless of how skilled everyone is, they still need their leader to be strong. 
Just then, Russell reveals that the province of Seats has made their first move, and Lord Lemire is asking Lamberg to take the field immediately. Lamberg's location puts them in great danger, but Raven is in no condition to battle. Ars determines that he will have to go, but he can't help but shake from fear. He pushes through and declares that he will lead their troops. Reitz assures Ars that his presence will give everyone courage, and he declares that he will make sure that Ars' first engagement is a victorious one. Ars speaks to all the troops and informs them that he will be leading them. However, just then he is shocked when Raven appears to say that he cannot let Ars take the battlefield just yet. Ars points out that Raven is in no condition to do battle, but Raven declares that he would gladly die serving the Canary District of Lamberg. Reach tries to argue for Ars, but Raven tells him to stay out of it. Ars tries to assure his father that he will be victorious, but Raven explains that the problem is that Ars doesn't have the face of a warrior yet. It's clear that Ars doesn't know what this means, so Raven has a soldier bring a man from the dungeon. His name is Baramorda, and he's considered a monster for committing all the most terrible crimes. Raven's illness has delayed Baramorda's execution, but Raven decides that they will carry it out now while Ars watches. If Ars can watch Baramorda die without losing his composure, then Raven will acknowledge him as a man and allow him to take command in the battle. Ars is in disbelief as they make the preparations, and he thinks about how he has never seen anyone have their life taken away. Baramorda shows just how much of a monster he is, as he states that he has taken the lives of many children, just like Ars. He talks about how much he enjoyed seeing the fear in their eyes, and this shocks Ars. Raven orders for the execution to begin, and Ars watches as Baramorda's head is removed. Ars's eyes begin to tremble as he is still only 11 years old, but he does his best to keep his composure. Unfortunately, the moment proves to be too gruesome, so he begins to vomit. Raven assures him that this is nothing to be ashamed of. His reaction is normal for the first time, and Raven admits that he reacted the same way. However, death constantly occurs during battle, and someone shaken by just one death cannot handle command. Raven declares that he will go this time, and the troops follow him as Ars is left behind. Ars's retainers rush to his side, but Raven tells them that it's time to move out, so they must follow his orders. Ars is all alone now, and he realizes that he didn't understand anything. He actually wasn't ready to go to war at all, and he really is just a child. At the conflict boundary, we watch as Raven and Ars's retainers take part in battle. Reitz and Raven fight on the front line, while Russell gives orders to adjust the army's formation. Charlotte does her thing and launches a massive fireball at a wall. Raven's illness is clearly taking a toll as he coughs blood, but he still fights valiantly. The enemy outnumbered the Canary army by 50%, but the Levant forces led by Raven allowed them to take the fortress they were after. The battle lasted over a month, and Raven returned 4 days after Ars' 12th birthday, but he was in bad shape. Ars' siblings fear that he might die, and Ars goes to speak with his retainers. He explains to Reitz that he was injured during training, and asks about his father. Reitz explains that Raven fought heroically, but his already failing health took its toll once the fighting was over. Ars blames himself for not being strong enough to go in Raven's place, but the others remind him that Raven was already sick. Ars asks to be told if Raven's condition changes, and goes to do more training. Reitz points out that it's already getting late, but Ars doesn't care. They're all worried about Ars, since they have heard that he has thrown himself headlong into daily training. Just then, the others are shocked when Leisha arrives at their front door. She is really concerned about Ars, because she has noticed a change in the letters that he has been sending recently. His writing used to be kind and warm, but now he seems distant. She wonders if something is wrong, so Reitz asks that she not be offended when he tells her that Ars has his reasons. Leisha becomes upset and explains that she's not offended, she is just worried. She desperately wants to know what's wrong, so everyone agrees to tell her. They tell her about the execution and about how Ars feels guilty for making Raven's condition worse. Leisha blames herself for not helping Ars sooner in his time of need, so she pleads for them to tell her where he is. Leisha excitedly goes to see Ars, but he's in the middle of some intense training. After he collapses to the ground, Ars is told that he can't physically handle any more training. Ars refuses to stop and points out that his father fought in a real battle in worse condition. Ars desperately wants to protect everyone just like his father, so he keeps sparring. The others are surprised when Leisha decides not to speak with him, so she explains that now is not the right time. 
Just then, the group is told that Raven has regained consciousness. Russell wants to tell Ars the good news, but it turns out that Raven wants to speak with the three of them first. Raven speaks to them casually, so Charlotte wonders who this guy is. Raven explains that he isn't speaking to them as their lord right now, and just wants to know if they like their lives in the house. It's like heaven to them, which Raven is glad to hear, but he reveals some bad news. He explains that he's not long for this world, so he wants to tell them something. He didn't expect much when Ars first brought them, but they have become vital pillars to their domain. Raven is glad to have met them, and he's proud of how much they have accomplished. They're all at a loss for words, and Raven reveals that he has a request for them. Ars is not strong enough for battle yet, and thrusting the lordship upon him now is very cruel. It's only now while he stands at death's doorstep does Raven realize how much he has left undone. Raven wishes he could have taken Ars to the battlefield sooner. That way he could have shown Ars the harsh realities of the world while he was still around to protect him from them. It's too late for that, so Raven asks the three of them to support Ars. He does not ask as the lord of a domain, Raven is asking as a father. He declares that he's proud to call Ars his son, so he pleads for them to grant him this wish. Russell credits Ars for fixing his relationship with his own father, so he declares that he will do whatever it takes to help Ars. Charlotte explains that Ars was the one that gave her life meaning, and she could never serve anyone else. Reese feels the same way, as he swears to fight for Ars even if it kills him. They all agree to support Ars, and they thank Raven for allowing them into his house. Reese has one request for Raven, which he agrees to, so Reese tells Leisha that Raven will speak with her. Leisha apologizes for having to meet for the first time under these conditions, but she's shocked to hear that they have met once before. Raven thought she was just an overly precautious girl when he first saw her, but he soon realized that she had a kindness within her. Raven wanted someone like her by Ars's side, so he requested her engagement to Ars. Raven fears that she might be unhappy about Ars's shortcomings, but that's the last thing on her mind. She admits that Ars's kindness can make him vulnerable, but she knows that he's trying desperately to overcome that to become more like Raven. Raven is glad to hear her speak this way because it's clear that she has fallen in love with Ars. Leisha proudly admits to loving Ars with all her heart, so Raven thanks her. Leisha leaves the room as Raven requests to see Ars next, and she thanks Reitz for helping her meet Raven. When Reitz is alone though, his mind is flooded with all the memories he has with Raven, and he breaks down in tears. Later, Ars excitedly goes to see his father, and is glad to hear that he's feeling better. Ars reveals that he has done tons of research on Raven's illness, and there are some remedies that he would like to try. Ars tries to talk about a doctor that might be able to help, but Raven interrupts him. Raven remembers being Ars' age when he ran away from home and fled to the city because of the tyrant that ruled his village. The governor of Mission happened to be visiting the city, and what Raven remembers most clearly is how grandiose he seemed. Raven was in awe of him, and he wanted to be just like him. Someone who could be governor and lead many soldiers. Raven taught himself the sword and became a soldier. He fought with all his heart and was recognized for his deeds. Eventually he was appointed by Lemire, and the next thing he knew he had his own domain. He treasures everyone who lives in Lamberg, and he devoted his life to protecting them. Ars becomes concerned when Raven starts coughing, and Raven reveals that he knows Ars blames himself for his condition. Raven assures him that it's not his fault, as this was the life he chose to live. Raven has a request for Ars, so he asks him to protect the people of Lamberg. Ars begins to break down, but he stops himself and declares that he will carry out his father's request. Raven can see the readiness in Ars' eyes, so he realizes that being his son must have been a great burden. Ars rejects the thought and declares that he's glad to be Raven's son. Raven breaks the sad moment by asking how things are going with Leisha, and the two talk about the past. They end up talking all through the night, and the rest of the family even joins them. Unfortunately, by the next day, Raven was gone. That night, Ars has his siblings say goodbye to their father as he is put to rest. Ars begins to cry a bit and gives a speech about how incredible his father was. He informs everyone that Raven entrusted him with taking care of everyone in Lamberg. Ars admits to not being as strong as his father, but he swears to care about them all more than anyone, and he vows to protect them. He asks that they lend him their aid, and they all encourage him by saying that they would do anything for him. Just then, Charlotte has a memory of when she tried to push herself on the battlefield. Raven told her to save that desperate effort for when it was Ars on the battlefield, so she promised to do just that. 
Russell then has a memory from when he stayed up really late studying, and he told Raven that he wanted to learn as much as he could so he could help ours. Raven reminded him that he had lots of time to grow so he could take his time and grow alongside ours. Leisha is saddened by a memory of her own, but she's glad to see how close everyone is in this moment. Ars thanks everyone for their support and asks his father to watch over them. Ars gathers himself as he turns to everyone and he declares that as of today, he is the master of House Levant. Everyone bows down to him and he states that the legend of House Levant begins now. Elsewhere, a mysterious woman overhears some guys talking about the assassination and she asks the guys to tell her more about it. Three months later, Ars tells his father that everyone has been helping him get used to his lordly duties. Ars knows that he could never measure up to his father, but he promises to do his best in his own way. The lords gather to honor Raven and announce that Ars has taken Mantle as the head of House Levant. Ars promises to do his best to fill his role, and the other lords are impressed by the confidence in his eyes. Ars is now on equal footing with them, and he gets excited when they say that they expect great things from him. The war between the brothers is really starting now, so Minas informs everyone of the situation. The younger brother holds soldiers and resources in greater number than theirs, and he occupies the capital of Mission Province. The older brother controls the trading city of Semplar, which gives them economic superiority, so the power of the two opposing cities is roughly even. This means that the surrounding districts will play a major role, so Lord Kiron has been trying to secure them. The problem is that one domain is refusing to cooperate. The domain is called Perania, and their location is right in the middle of an important route that they need for running supplies to the front line. They were hoping to avoid any pointless fighting, but this route is vital, so they decide to conquer Perenia. Just then, Ars shocks everyone when he requests that they allow him to try something first. A look back shows that Russell became suspicious of the way the enemy army was moving. Reitz agreed with him, but they weren't sure about what was wrong. What they did know was that attacking without knowing would be really bad, so they decided to gather information first. To do this, Reitz recommended a mercenary group called Shadow. They specialize in gathering intel, and Rumor says that they're frighteningly good at it. They all agreed, so Russell asked Ars to bring it up at the next meeting. Ars now explains to the Lords how strange it is that the enemy doesn't back down, despite being surrounded by enemies. Ars does some convincing, so he's given time to investigate the situation. Afterwards, our group goes to see Charlotte's orphans that have all grown up. Ars had an orphanage built, and he made sure that Charlotte's kids were accepted into it. That is and all as he asked those that were in charge to take in any homeless kids they could find. Charlotte catches up with the kids, and they tell her all their plans for the future. One wants to join Lumiere's army, and another wants to be a farmer. They thank Ars for changing their lives, but he points out that Charlotte also helps by sending most of her salary to them. The kids thank her as well, and promise to do their best. Charlotte thought about bringing them all to Lamberg, but she realizes now that leaving them here was for the best. Living in a big city provides many opportunities, and children should experience lots of things. Just then, Ars is shocked when Leisha appears out of nowhere, and she explains that she came with her father. She then rushed to find Ars when she heard that he was there. Ars has no clue what to do because he was not mentally prepared to face her right now. Leisha is amazed by the orphanage, and she is in awe of how happiness just seems to follow Ars wherever he goes. One of the little parentless kids gets carried away and ruins Lisa's dress, so Ars promises to buy her a new one. Leisha's pretty laid back about it though, and she has to join the kids' game. Her butler wishes she wouldn't, but Ars admires her for it. That night, Ars explains that Reese will be getting him in touch with their mercenary group called Shadow. If they agree to meet with him, then Ars is going to negotiate with them about a job. Leisha would like to accompany him, but Ars points out that it could be dangerous. Leisha casually points out that Ars will have his backup with him, and she is sure that Reitz will be able to protect them. Ars gives in and explains that he will go get her if the mercenaries agree to meet with him, but Ars is shocked when Leisha reveals that she will be staying with them. Leisha guilts Ars into letting her stay, so he goes to prepare a room for her. This crazy girl says she wouldn't mind sharing a room, but Ars refuses. Charlotte explains that Ars will be staying in her room, and Reitz arrives to see the strange moment. Charlotte tells Russell that he will be joining them, so Reitz apologizes to his little buddy and leaves. The next morning, the boys are exhausted because Charlotte's constant tossing during the night kept them up. Reitz arrives to reveal that he has received word from Shadow, and they all say goodbye to the orphans. 
The kids point out that they might not be there the next time they visit because they will have achieved their dreams. Our group eventually leaves and ours can tell that Charlotte is in a good mood. Reitz explains that he was able to get into contact with Shadow because of his old mercenary group. Mercenary groups will hand off jobs to each other because they all have different specialties. His group did frontline battles, but Shadow specializes more in covert operations, intelligence, espionage, and even sometimes assassination. Ours is shocked to hear this and realizes just how scary Shadow is. Just then, Reitz reveals that he's concerned about something. He has heard that Shadow's old leader stepped down and was replaced by someone pretty young. This person is very competent and Shadow is now far more capable than it's ever been. That doesn't seem like much of a problem to ours, so Reitz goes on to say that the leader only takes jobs that they are interested in. Ours assumes that they will just have to pay a good price, but that isn't the issue. The issue is that they don't know what kind of jobs the leader likes. Lord Lumiere is counting on them, so ours is determined to get the mercenaries to take the job. They arrive at the bar to meet with the mercenaries, but they are told to leave because they are full. Ours is then amazed when Reed says the secret phrase and they're allowed to enter. Everyone stares at them though, so Charlotte asks for permission to roast all of them with the fire spell. Her request is denied, so they just order instead. Ours realizes that the mercenary group specializes in information gathering, so their leader might be watching them right now. Ours tries to use his ability to find the leader, but the others remind him to order. Just then, the look of terror appears on Ars's face when he uses his ability on the waitress. Ars doesn't want to give himself away, so he calmly orders and excuses himself to the restroom. When alone, Ars trembles in fear and determines that there must just be something wrong with his appraisal skill. He uses it on Reitz though, and it seems to be working just fine. Ars is terrified because the waitress had a prowess of 92 and ingenuity of 90. Those are incredible stats, but what's more shocking is that the waitress is actually a 22-year-old man. Just then, the guy pulls a knife on Ars and demands to know how Ars knew that he is the leader of Shadow. Ars doesn't answer, but luckily Reitz appears to save Ars. Reitz is furious and wonders if this guy knows who he is attacking. The guy wonders how Reitz knew to come to the rescue, and Ars can't figure it out either. Leisha arrives as well and points out that the leader has to accept Ars' job after he treated him so poorly. This guy is defiant as he wonders what they would do if he declined. He doesn't want anyone to know his identity, so he contemplates using all his tricks to eliminate Ars and run away. Leisha puts this guy in his place by pointing out that Reitz is there so the leader would struggle to just escape with his life. Ars is then in shock as he realizes that they are negotiating without him. The guy still considers declining, so Leisha explains that she holds grudges. This guy mentioned eliminating Ars earlier, so Leisha declares that if he did that, then she would pursue him to the furthest reaches of the world and end him. Ars has never been more terrified of her, and the leader laughs and apologizes for being rude. He still wants to know how Ars knew he was the leader, since he thought that his disguise was perfect. Ars just comes right out and reveals that he has an appraisal skill that allows him to perceive the abilities of others. The guy has a hard time believing this, but he is shocked when Ars calls him Mazik. Ars is then the one to be shocked when the leader says that he threw that name away a long time ago. He goes by the name Fam now, but the fact that Ars knew his original name is proof that he's telling the truth about his ability. Fam agrees to take the job, and he just hopes that he doesn't have to see Alicia get mad again. Ars points out that Fam doesn't even know what the job is, but he explains that he already knows everything he needs to know. He's able to judge someone's character by the people they surround themselves with. In Ars's case, he has the really strong Reitz by his side, and Leisha is intimidating beyond her years, and she also admires Ars a lot. Fam compares doing the job for Ars to betting on a winning horse. Leisha explains that she noticed the face Ars made when he looked at their supposed waitress. She determined that he must have noticed it was the leader, so Reitz decided to follow him. Ars thanks him for saving his life, and he thinks about how dependable Leisha is. Ars explains the details of the job, so Fam only charges him one gold since it's their first time working together. Ars is then surprised to hear that it will only take Fam five days to get the information. Fam reminds him that this is his specialty, so Ars can't wait to see what he comes up with. A look into the past shows what happened when our trio returned to the others, and Ars explained that they ran into the shadow leader. Charlotte is glad to hear that he accepted their request, and she would like to meet the leader one day. Just then, Fam returns as their waitress and gives Charlotte some pancakes on the house. 
Ours is amazed by his presence, since he never would have guessed he was Shadow's leader if he didn't see his stats. Five days later, Ours meets with Fam, who's all alone, because the other members of Shadow are out on a mission. Ours is shocked to hear that Fam handled Ours' investigation on his own, and he realizes that Fam's incredible skill is what makes him Shadow's leader. Ours is glad to hear that the mission was a complete success, but can only wonder how Fam did it so quickly. Unfortunately, that's a trade secret, but Fam has a lot to tell him. The reason why the Perina district won't side with Curon is because they're part of a pact. A document Fam has obtained shows the signatures of all the nobles who have sided with Lord Vasmarki. Just then, Reitz is shocked when he recognizes one of the signatures and its seal. It belongs to the Masa district, which has a large population. It also has one of the continent's biggest infantries. They would be a powerful ally to whichever side they take, and luckily Masa District has chosen Lord Curon, just like they have. However, their seal being on this document that pledges support to Vasmarki means that the Masa District has betrayed them. The problem this brings is that if they invade Perina, then Masa will likely attack them from behind. Fam thinks Perina knew this, and realized that siding with Curon would be a losing prospect. That explains why they won't play along. Reitz wants to verify that the document is genuine by having Fam explain how he got it, but Fam doesn't share his methods with anyone, even his most trusted allies. Fam does say that he got the document from where the headman lives, so Reitz apologizes for doubting him. Fam's job is done, so he allows them to take the document, and Ars thinks about how cool he is. Ars prepares to pay him, but Fam says it's not necessary because he treated Ars so poorly before. Fam wants him to consider it an apology and investment into their future, so Ars promises to pay him extra for the next job. Ars and Reitz then leave to inform Lord Lemire of Masa's betrayal. Lemire is shocked by the news, and he realizes that getting Perina on their side will be no easy feat. He has Mina show the document to the other lords, and Lemire thanks Ars for allowing them to avoid a big mistake. Lemire decides that he needs to consult with Curon, and he would like Ars' help. However, just then, Mina says that there is something strange about the pact. The signature and seal of the Masa district is not right. He compares it to the actual seal and signature, and there is a clear difference. All the others are correct, but Masa district's seal and signature on the pact seems to be forged. Perinia was deceived into believing that Masa betrayed them, which is the only reason they sided with Vasmarki. Minas has a very sharp eye, so Lemire assures everyone that they can trust that what he says is true. Ars is amazed that Minas has this much skill. His appraisal ability lets him see stats, but it doesn't show him the special skills a person has. Ars doesn't understand why this lie would be pushed so much, since it was bound to be found out eventually. The others assume that it was to buy time. If they attacked Perina, they would have won, but it would have taken a while as they fought back. All that seems to matter to the people behind the lie is having Perina on their side for the time being. Perina is disposable to them, which means that their real goal must be something called Explosion Magistones. They are extremely valuable Magistones that are only found in Perina and in three other districts. When refined, Explosion Magistones allow for the use of powerful magic and can be used to make even more powerful weapons. Vast Marky must be after these stones, and everyone is shocked when Russell says that this means that attacking Perina is out of the question. If they whittle each other down by attacking, then they will be playing right into Vast Marky's hands. Their only real option is to tell Perina the truth and win them over. The problem is that all messengers that have been sent there were all turned away. Sometime later, we see that Aris has gone to meet with the headman of Perina himself. Surprisingly, Ars tells him that he knows about the pact and declares that Lamberg wants to side with Vast Marky. Ars acts like he doesn't know that Masa's signature was forged and tells the headman that Lumir wants to join Vast Marky's side as well. The headman is glad to see that Lamberg is under the control of a competent leader and states that he will speak to Vast Marky himself. He is sure that Lamberg will be accepted onto their side. However, Ars says that he has some questions first. The headman confirms that the pact is genuine by saying that it was given to him directly by Vasmarki. Ars points out that Masa's headman has been loyal to Curon and questions why he would betray him now. The headman says that betrayal is normal in a time of war, but Ars still questions why Masa would side with Vasmarki since it would leave them surrounded. All this questioning makes the headman realize that this meeting was all a ruse. 
He demands for Ars to be arrested, but Reitz reveals himself to protect Ars. Ars explains that they are not there to fight, so the headman demands to know why he came. Ars then shocks everyone when he reveals that he brought the headman of Masa to explain himself. A look back shows that this was all Russell's idea. They showed the document to the Masa headman and he was shocked as he never signed the pact. Ars requested that the headman write a letter for him to take to the Perina headman, but this guy was furious. He's upset that someone forged the Masa seal and he declared that he would visit Perina's headman and reveal the truth himself. He does just that and declares that he has served Lord Curon from the beginning, so he will continue to do so until the end. Knowing this information, he wonders if Perina will still side with Vasmarki. The Perina headman would like to side with Curon after finding out the truth, but he wonders if Curon will really take them back. The Masa headman can't be sure, but he does know that his Masa district has a huge population. He has a lot of people to protect, and he is sure that the Perina headman feels the same way about his people. The problem he has is that the Perina headman was fooled so easily and didn't investigate the legitimacy of the pact. Ars is amazed by the Masa headman's commanding presence and realizes that he must rise to his level. The headman credits Ars for bringing light to this situation, so he leaves the decision of whether or not to accept Perina to him. Ars acknowledges that the guy was easily fooled, but Ars doesn't want to cut anyone out for a single mistake. Ars knows that he might be behaving naively, but he's just glad that they could settle things without a fight. Ars then declares that they can be allies, and the Perina headman promises to serve the best he can. There's nothing left to discuss, so Ars thanks the Masa headman for coming. The headman thanks Ars since he was able to see through the enemy's plan and resolve it without bloodshed. He's glad to see that the Canary district has made a fine addition to its leadership. Later, Ars explains all this to his father. Aside from all the good news, Ars has learned that Vasmarki did manage to acquire large numbers of explosion magistones from the Purina district. Reitz and Russell arrive, and Ars credits them for helping him resolve the issue without anyone getting hurt. Reitz can tell that there's something on his mind, but Ars just says that he knows what he has to do. The problem is that it will be difficult to accomplish. The headmen he met recently were desperate to protect their people, and Ars wants to become a strong lord just like them. However, without his friends, Ars feels like he would have been powerless in this situation. Reitz assures him by saying that he has them, and they will always be by his side. All Ars needs to do is what he feels is right. Just then, Ars is told that Lord Lemire has arrived at Raven's grave. Lemire apologizes for not visiting sooner, and tells Raven that Lord Curon would like to meet with Ars. Ars is shocked to hear this since he's just the leader of a tiny territory, and Curon is a big shot. Ars thinks he is unworthy, but Lemire explains that he informed Kiron about the recent incident and he has taken an interest in Ars. Ars accepts the decision and plans to prepare himself for whenever that day might come. He is of course shocked when Lemire reveals that he will be going to meet Lord Kiron right now. Ars thinks it's too sudden, but his friends encourage him and point out that this is a great opportunity for him to move up in the world. They give Ars some confidence, so he declares that he's ready to go. Thanks for watching my recap, subscribe to the channel to help us make the push to 700,000 subscribers.